talking. Who in here has a brother or a sister? Wow, that's a lot of y'all. That's a, that's a whole bunch. How many of y'all have been living in Plaquemines Parish your whole life? Went to primary school, you're at middle school, and you're gonna go to the high school. All right, so I did the same thing. I might be a little bit older than, and I mean a little bit older than y'all. Um, but I did the same exact thing. So I wanna introduce y'all to Travis. Cute little baby, huh? That's right. So Travis is three years older than me. And he was born with just as much promise and just as much of a future as you and you and me. He had the same exact upbringing as me. Mom and dad, same house, watching the tales and tailspin and the cartoons in the afternoon when we got home from school. Such Travis, pretty green eyes. It's one of my favorite pictures of us. So you can kind of see how close we were. So Travis, best friend. Everybody in here has that best friend. I know you might not be there yet with your brother or sister. They're still kind of aggravating, huh? Sometimes you want to step on their toes under the dinner table, huh? You want to jump them sometimes and not get caught by mom because you'll get in trouble. So we did all the same things. He used to teach me how to fight. I think my worst years of my life was when he took karate. And then again, when he was uh, in wrestling, I was always in the bottom. I was always the dummy, like, stay still, I'm gonna get you. Yeah, he, he got me. Travis was my confidant. See that bag? That bag is from Dare, y'all. That's the old gruff. <laughs> I told him everything, but I didn't do my homework. When I knew I was gonna get in trouble for mom, I'd go ask him, hey, what was the punishment he gave you, she gave you last time? How bad is it gonna be for me? When I had an argument with my best friend in the whole wide world, like, man, I'm, I'm really never gonna talk to her again. It is not happening. And he'd be like, no, you're in the wrong. You have to go apologize. And so I would. When I started writing notes to little boys, this was back before texting, y'all don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> but I would tell him, or he would intercept them and be like, uh-uh, you're not sending it to that guy. I don't like him. Travis was my teacher. He taught me how to be a good person. Tell me how to be a good friend. Tell me how to be a confidant to my friends. Tell me how to ride my bike. Tell me how to change my oil in my car when we got older. I had a real old car too. I always had problems. I got a flat tire and Blackman Spanish couldn't come save me. He'd come pick me up and, and fix it for me or show me how to do it. Just a little glimpse of my family. Went on vacation. That's me. Look at me, y'all, real cute with that jogging pants suit. That was the style, with cool short hair. I don't think I had any front teeth in that picture. That's why I didn't smile. So we did everything together. Family vacations, the whole nine. We were very, very close. We talked to each other about everything. Just like you should with your parents. And your aunts and uncles. Or your pastor. Or your priest. Or your sheriff. This is about seventh grade. Y'all are almost there. This is a really awkward point in your life. You don't know it right now, but it's coming. So this is about the point in life when you know you really start to find out who you are. You get to be selective with your friends. You know, you have a group of people that you always hang out with. You're at their house after school, riding bikes to the other one's house. They all sleep over at so-and-so's house. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all got friends like that? All right, we're together. So these are some of Travis's friends. So after a while, um, you know, my brother's in high school, making straight A's. He was a member of the National Honor Society. Um, he had scholarships to go to UNO. He wanted to be an engineer. He always loved to take things apart and then put them back together again. I remember when we were little kids, our, uh, our street would flood, but we would, well, we may have helped it out. <laughs> because we just wanted to play in it, you know, it was fun. We would make little boats, and you put a little nine volt battery on the back of it with a little propeller, and we'd race boats down the street. He was a good kid, really good kid. He was voted cutest boy in high school. He was the kind of kid that you wanted your daughter to take to homecoming, or him to take her, rather, and you wanted your son to hang out with him. Smart, witty, super funny. 
Travis went to college, started out at SLU at Southeastern University. And um, at first, I would see him like every other weekend. Really cool. We would reconnect. We talk about everything that happened while he was gone on, on, in school. He'd tell me about what was happening in his classes, and I would be like, oh, I'm so not ready for that yet. And we would just share what was going on in our lives. Then he stopped coming home so often. Those every other weekends turned into once a month, turned into just for Christmas, just for Easter. And when he was there, I could tell there was some distance between us two. And he confided in me that he had started smoking marijuana. And so I was like, man, you know, you, you really shouldn't, you really shouldn't do that. He said, well, but Lord, you know, it's a plant. It's from the earth, and it's okay. Like, you know, God made it for us, so I'm going to have it. Plus, you feel, like, super cool when you're on it. And it doesn't do anything to you. Like, all you do is you get happy, you laugh, and then you're hungry later, and then you fall asleep. Like, it's fine. So I, you know, shook my fist and said, this is really a bad idea. You, you know, you're going down a slippery slope. So then the next time when he came home for Easter break, told me that he started using prescription pain pills. They had found them in somebody's grandmother's medicine cabinet and started taking them. And I'm not gonna lie to you and sugarcoat anything and think that you don't know where those things are right now. I know you do, but they're just not for you. Those things have a reason when people have to take them and that's not yours. And those weren't my brothers. But then he would go to everybody else's house and he would steal their pills too. Somebody had a surgery in the past six months. He was coming to visit. And he was jacking your pills. And he's taking them. And he couldn't keep a job. Working while he's going to school. Grades start slipping. His priorities changed dramatically. They went from being a a student, National Honor Society, here's your scholarship. Come to school with us. Please come to our school. We want to put you through school for free. So you know what? When you pack your things to leave for a summer break, don't come back. You can forget your scholarship. It's over. We don't want that kind of student here. So Travis comes home. Defeated. Sad even more detached. He's broken. I can remember this image, this was taken. I was working one night and I got a phone call from a Gretna police officer. Y'all know where Gretna is, huh? It's on the way to the mall. <laughs> so we were in Gretna one night, oh, he's in Gretna rather, and um, a police officer calls me and asks me, are you going for me on? And I said, yes sir, yes I am. He said, well, I need you to meet me at this street by the expressway right now. And it was like, it was like two in the morning. I'm like, what, what's going on? You know, I'm really nervous. And uh, he tells me, well, I have your brother here. So of course I take off and I race to go pick him up. I'm concerned. I get there and um, he's, not, he's not anywhere to be seen. Like I can't see him. And I'm asking the officer, where is he? Where is he? He said, oh, he's sleeping in the back of my car. He said, come see. So he walked me around to the front of the car and he showed me there was a pile of sparklers like the kind of sparklers we used on New Year's, in front of his car. His car was a little wrecked, couldn't be moved. And I said, well, what was going on? He said, oh, we found him asleep in front of the car. He was trying to repair his vehicle with sparklers. Now, sparklers aren't tools, right? But in his mind, he thought that they were. That's how far he was on these prescription pills and how the weed just couldn't quench it anymore. So he took more pills and more pills and more pills. Couldn't keep a job. So I load him into my car and I take him home the next morning. He has no idea what happened. No clue. So I had explained to him how hard it hurt for me to have to get a phone call from a police officer to come get him. I thought they wanted me to come identify his body. How hard would that have been? After he wrecked his truck, kind of can't go anywhere. You lose your sense of freedom. Can't drive. I can't keep a job because every time I get a job, I get paid 
And then what do I do with my paycheck? What you think he did with his paycheck? He bought more drugs. Every time, he get a different job, collect a paycheck. What do you do? Buy more drugs, you got it. It became his only priority to buy more drugs, use more drugs. I was losing my brother. He was slipping away. Travis's friends, his good buddies, that he, the, those relationships that he had fashioned and forged since seventh and eighth grade, where you guys are about to be, they said, you know what, Lori, Miss Lee, Mr. Pat, you know, we know you've tried to put Travis in rehab, but we're gonna try to go give him some tough love. We're gonna take him fishing, his favorite thing to do in the whole wide world. And we're gonna try and intervene. We're gonna have a conversation with him. We're gonna be really ferocious and mean and stern about it, and he's gonna listen. So they took Travis fishing, and they told him all these things, you know, Dan, you're not who I thought you were. You're not who we used to be friends with. You're somebody different now. You've been kicked out of school. All of us are still in college. We're all still doing good. We're gonna graduate next year. And where are you? At home, paying a bunch of fines for all the tickets you got for driving when you shouldn't have been driving on all kinds of pills. Nobody trusts you. I didn't trust him. My mom didn't trust him. My aunts and uncles didn't trust him. They would all hide their, their uh, medicine before he came over. That's how bad it was. And Travis left that and did this. This is another time that he did not remember this happening. Does everybody know where the new flood wall is? Right near Captain Larry's on Highway 23? Okay, so my brother, was coming home from going fishing, going out all night, drinking, partying, taking pills. Had his seatbelts on. It's the only thing that saved him. And did this. He hit a boat on a trailer on the back of a truck. He hit the boat so hard he knocked the motor off of the boat. And he's lucky he didn't kill anyone that night. And I had a long, hard conversation with him about this. I said, you know, man, that, that could have been me. That could have been me coming in the other direction. I could have been coming home from going somewhere and you could have just hit me in a head-on collision. And how could you live knowing that you had done this to me? So we went and picked him up from jail again. <coughs> I want y'all to think back to that image of that little baby boy with so much promise and all those visions in his future ahead of him. Do you think that this was what he imagined he would be like? That's a really sad picture. It's kind of like there's no one home. And that's how we all felt, like there was no one home. Things started to look up after this. <laughs> Went through a DUI program, he had to go uh, to all these meetings, he had to pay all these fines. He lost his truck, he lost his driver's license for a year. He started to get a job. At this point, I'm married. I was pregnant with my first child. And I was making such an impact on my parents' relationship that I decided to move him in with me. And so Travis called me one night after we the last DUI case, uh, court day, excuse me, um, it was a Friday. And he called me and he said, hey, will you come, will you, can I go to a party? And I said, sure, because I was kind of like his, his parochial officer. I was like, nah, you can't go over there. I don't like them people. I know what they do. I'm on it. No, I know them. No, you cannot hang out with them. So he asked me, can I go to this birthday party at this person's house? I said, sure, I'll bring you. And I'll pick you up. He's got no car, no driver's license, no nothing. So I got to do it. So now the roles are kind of reversed. He's kind of like my, my, my brother child thing. He's older than me. So I bring him to the party, and at about 11 o'clock at night, he called me. He said, hey, can you come tell me? Can you come pick me up? I said, dude, what is going on with you? He'd be clean, six months, totally clean. I can tell you he's messed up. So I'm mad, I'm furious. Driving to this party, he calls me on my way. He says, well, I'm not at that house anymore. I'm at this house. He broke my trust now, big time. You're messed up. You left that party, you went to some place where you weren't supposed to be with people you should not be hanging out with, and you knew it. He gave in to that temptation, 
and now I have to clean up his mess. So I pick him up in my car, and really, y'all, I, I was probably the most upset and angry and frustrated I've ever been. I'm talking about seven years of my life trying to help this dude, trying to get him to see his own potential. So I bust at him, told him, you know, you're killing mom. Mom said, high blood pressure, her heart's weak. Yo, they're about to get a divorce because of you. You live with me. I'm your little sister. And I'm taking care of you like you're a child, a big man child. This has got to stop. So we sat on my back porch and he cried. And we hung out together for a minute. And I remember watching the bugs turn around and swarm around the light. And I walked him into the room. The next day was the uh, opening of duck hunt season. He said, look, can you wake me up early because I'm going to go pull in Aaron's weeds to make some cash to get my duck license. I said, sure, man. You know, we both need a diffuse. We need to take a break from one another. So I walked him to his room. <clears throat> I took off his shoes, tucked him under the covers, and he said, can you turn the air conditioning down for me? And I said, yeah. I said, I love you. He said, I love you too. When I woke up the following morning, something was wrong. I went running into his room, and his room was cold. And I remember I got right up to his face, and I touched him. And he was cold, and his lips were blue. And I screamed, and I dropped to my knees, and I wanted to fix it, I wanted to wake him up. I wanted to make it okay again, because that's my job. For seven years, my job was to make it okay. When he wasn't there, I couldn't wake him up. I called 911. Police came. Policeman and I never said a word to each other. He just looked at me and shook his head. Then I already knew. And then I forgot. I had to call my mom. <laughs> Their parents, now that I'm a parent, I cannot imagine what it must have been like for her to yield a phone call from one child telling her that the other child was dead. And I remember I struggled for the words. What can I tell her? Can I tell her that something was wrong? Can I say that there was an accident? Can I say like he wasn't breathing right? Like how, how can I buffer this for her? And I couldn't. And she answered the phone, felt like it took an hour. I just said, Mommy, he's dead. And she let out this sound that I can hear any given day of the week. It never goes away. It sounded like an animal being slaughtered. And I know that was part of her soul, just escaping. And we had to have even harder conversations after that. What is, what would you think he would like to wear to be buried in? What kind of casket are we gonna get him? Do we need colored flowers? Should there be music? We did all those hard things. And I, I got to do all those hard things so that I can come here and have this conversation with you. I don't have to come to this. I don't have to come tell this story. It's really painful for me to come and share this with y'all. But I do it, and I do it often, because you're worth it. You're worth it, and you're worth it, and you're worth it, and you, all of you. I don't want your parents to have to think about your casket. I don't want you to have to make a phone call to your mom about your brother. I've been in sixth grade, I've been in fifth grade. And I'm gonna tell you, from experience, drugs are here. As much as we want to prevent them from coming to you, they are going to. You are the only thing that prevents you from doing drugs. You have to make good decisions 
quality decision that your future self will thank you for. If you have the ambition to be a cop, to be an astronaut, to be a doctor, to be a teacher, you want to be a firefighter. That is your goal. And don't let anything anyone ever offers you get in the way of that goal. You know what's right. You get that little feeling in your gut it tells you, no, oh, no, 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 this is a bad idea. My mom would kill me if she found out I did this. Yes, yeah, she will. Don't do it. Listen to that because this is what happens. You become your choices. My brother made great choices, but then he made really bad choices. And now, <laughs> now <laughs> we get to live with those choices. We needed that because some of y'all were crying real hard, especially you. I saw that. with every student that ever crosses in front of this stage when I leave here. Y'all can call me if you want to ask me questions. I'm not a policewoman, I'm not an officer, but I'll, I'll help you. If you're having a hard time making a decision, I want to help you because I don't want you to end up that way. Thank y'all.